Hello, I'm Jerome Booth, Chairman of New Sparta, and in fact, Chairman of New Sparta Asset Management, and I'm here today at the FT uh, African Infrastructure Conference, where I'm giving a keynote uh, talking about uh, the macroeconomic environment uh, surrounding asset allocation today, and the problems of the lack of infrastructure investment in Africa, something that my asset management company is going to try and do something about in its own small way, uh, and the uh, huge amounts of capital which exists in the West, uh, which apparently for reasons of asset allocation methodology, uh, can't find its way uh, to, to these uh, needs in Africa. So I'll be talking about why that's the case. Our, our next speaker is Jerome Booth. Um, Jerome is going to give us a keynote presentation. Uh, Jerome is known to us at the FT as one of the leading thinkers on emerging markets worldwide. Uh, he had a glittering career at Ashmore uh, Fund Management Company, and uh, he's the author of a book. It doesn't say so in your bio, actually, Jerome. I'm surprised you missed that out. You had too much else to put in there. Uh, he's the author of an excellent book called Emerging Markets in an Upside-Down World, um, but today, I think Jerome is speaking um, in the capacity of his day job, which is as chairman of New Sparta Limited. Uh, New Sparta is a company that manages controlling interests in a number of companies in insurance, telecoms, film, journalism, fund management, and publishing. And I think I'm right in saying that's mostly in the emerging world. So Jerome, please welcome to come up. Um, so, uh, yes, I was going to sort of, I was very interested in the session this morning and I wanted to give you a little bit more of my bio so you know where I'm coming from. Um, I'm an economist um, and uh, actually worked in the Inter-American Development Bank uh, doing their strategic planning in the early 90s as well, so I know a little bit about development banking. And um, uh, since I retired from Ashmore, which I was a co-founder of um, about three years ago, um, I, I uh, acquired uh, the sixth largest ISP in the UK and then invested into India. Um, and I have two uh, companies now in India, the number one Wi-Fi hotspot, public Wi-Fi hotspot company in India and also uh, an instant messenger uh, with about uh, 210 million customers. And um, what was interesting is was going in, you know, having been a portfolio investor, having managed uh, with Ashmore $80 billion in emerging markets, um, uh, as a portfolio investor, including about 10 billion in private equity, um, I felt it was very different coming in and investing as a sort of multinational company. Um, you know, I think one trip we had 18, well, 17 telecom experts and me on the trip, and the ability to really sort of see the nuts and bolts, um, you know, impressed me, and you got a different reception. So I've been sort of thinking about how one mixes that. Um, with uh, the, the, the enormous needs. And I think we've had a lot of insight so far this morning on, you know, the need. We have, uh, you know, you just look at a, a night satellite, uh, you know, picture of Africa, and it's dark. You know, there are uh, very few lights. Even for the level of, the low level of income, uh, there's about a third the amount of electricity uh, as you would expect. And so there's a huge bottleneck, and it is really the number one bottleneck. Um, and it fascinates me how uh, you know, little attention this is given in asset allocation. In fact, my, my book is really a, a critique of finance theory. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that, a little bit about the macroeconomics. And then, if you like, this is, I'm trying to give you a bit of a big picture, certainly from my, my perspective, of, of how we solve some of these problems. Um, first of all, finance theory is very new, and it is not fit for purpose. I mean, the basic, my basic thesis is that... Um, uh, it, the in a, inappropriate apl application of finance theories and finance ideas has basically caused a massive misallocation of capital on a global scale, affecting hundreds of millions of people. And uh, I'll give you some, some examples. I mean, back in 1959, Markowitz um, wrote a, a monogram. It was a book, really. It was 360 pages. And he says that uh, the variability of an asset can be described in terms of the uh, uh, idiosyncratic, he calls it risk, he means volatility, uh, idiosyncratic risk, uh, which can be just hedged out, um, which is not related to anything else, the uh, covariances with other uh, assets in the asset class, uh, and 
the correlation to an index. And then he says, and remember this is before sort of computers, but for, but for computational ease, we'll just ignore the covariances with all our assets. In other words, you can have a whole bunch of, of you know, uh, 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 certain types of, of company but clearly are affected in the same way by, by a, a change in the environment. And then that is all just ignored. And that is also the germ of the idea that one can describe the world in terms of asset classes, and that asset classes are the building blocks of asset allocation. And the life, unfortunately, is not that simple, because you can actually sort of cross asset classes. You can actually uh, do all sorts of things which uh, are simple, uh, um, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, course in, in finance will not tell you. Um, for example, one is taught that, um, you know, as you randomly add uh, 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 assets to a portfolio, after about 15 assets, you can't get lower volatility uh, than that of the, of the index. But the key word here was random. If, of course, you don't add them randomly, of course you can. And it's, it's perfectly obvious that you can. Um, so we have also the, the problem that what is an asset class? An asset class is basically a function of marketing. Uh, in the beginning, there were two asset classes, uh, basically US Treasuries and the S&P. The world outside of the United States does not exist. And um, eventually, after a lot of evolution, we have the Yale model. Uh, which is wonderful, which says that you can invest in, you know, more than a couple of asset classes. Diversification is a good idea. Even you can invest in less liquid things, illiquid things. You can actually do private equity. The problem is that the way that this evolves, this idea about what is investable, and by the way, when we use the word investable, we don't mean investable, we mean easy to invest in. Um, when we, as we evolve the asset classes, that, that evolution is slower than the change in the real world. And it's a function, you know, if I'm a pension fund manager in the United States, uh, I've, got I've got hundreds of people walking through my door every day trying to sell me things, or every, every year anyway. And uh, if I've got a, you know, the 57th person trying to tell me that covered bonds is an asset class, eventually I give up and I put it to my investment committee, oh, covered bonds is an asset class, okay, all right. Well, you know, these five other pension funds have already done it, so that's okay. And then it's an asset class. And emerging markets, uh, generally, you know, wasn't an asset class. Uh, Antoine van Ackmel created the term when he worked at the IFC, and then it was an asset class, but just for equities. Emerging market debt became an asset class much more recently, and then there are, of course, many, many different types of emerging market debt. <laughs> uh, and, and we have this evolution, but the world is moving faster. So the gap between reality and what lives in the world of the mind of asset allocators is actually growing larger. And this is a major problem. How, how should we actually think about the, the investable universe? I mean, the, the, um, uh, there are two ways to value uh, anything, any asset, any financial asset. One is some sort of replacement value, Tobin's Q or something. And the other is uh, income. And actually, it's income <laughs> that everybody wants. Future income is what the investor wants. And the best measure of future income is past income. And the best measure of past income is GDP. That's what it is. So if we look at GDP, certainly if we do purchasing power parity, then uh, we're talking about almost 60% of uh, uh, GDP in the world economy is from emerging markets. So why aren't investors, you know, sitting here in the UK or the United States actually, you know, much, much more invested in emerging markets? Um, and I think there are a number of reasons. First of all, people say, well, of course, our liabilities are all, you know, domestic. Well, are they? There's a thing we economists call money illusion. Uh, call, call money illusion. This is the idea that we confuse currencies. Uh, actually, uh, uh, if you're, you know, any currency is a currency risk. The dollar is a currency risk. Sterling is a currency risk. If I'm uh, thinking ahead uh, about the macroeconomic problems, which I, if I've got time, I'm going to say a little bit about in a moment, um, I think there's a very good probability we have a period of high inflation like we did in the 70s. So... If you think about that for a moment, what that means is that I might be contributing to a pension fund uh, in the UK today with a view to retire in 20 years. And in 20 years, I might get a pension, you know, of, I don't know, £3,000 a month or something. And it might basically, it might, make, it might buy me a glass of water. 
You know, that's, that's, that's the effect of inflation. I'm not going to be very happy with my pension fund manager, but my pension fund manager at the, time, at the moment can say, yes, well, your liabilities uh, nominally are, are you know, that amount, and I'm managing to that. And, of course, if inflation becomes a problem, we might see that that uh, legislative environment changes <laughs> and that uh, trustees will be forced to look at the purchasing power, the future purchasing power of their savers as being their objective function, which it isn't at the moment. And the fact that there's a difference, the biggest problem in, 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 in asset allocation of all, is an agency problem. If you're an open economy like the UK, um, there's also a question about where your liabilities lie because of the structure of the global economy. If 90% of all the cars in the world are produced in emerging markets uh, and bought in emerging markets, then you can say there's a global price, or that you know, supply and demand is dominated by emerging markets, therefore the global price is, is basically an emerging market set price. And emerging markets increasingly are price setters, not just price takers. So that's the world we live in. And, and insofar, therefore, as one doesn't invest in emerging markets, one is gambling away from one's liabilities defined in terms of purchasing power. This is nowhere in the way that, you know, this is not the way that, that standard allocation is thought of. Instead, we've got this system of, of, you know, if you want to invest in infrastructure in Africa, that's either you know, a very small part of another, very, it's a small part of, of private equity, uh, uh, which is a small part of emerging markets, or, or the other way around, you know, and, and it's a, a tiny allocation, minuscule. So let's talk a little bit more about, uh, I've, got, I've written a whole book about this, so I'm not going to go on about the finance theory problems, but there is also another problem, which I call core periphery disease, and I call it a disease because it's a, a meme, an intellectual virus, which has been us with, with us for a couple of hundred years. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's this idea that whatever happens in the core affects the periphery, but of course the periphery is entirely uh, irrelevant to, to the core. And that's the way we see the world. You know, we always refer back to, to the West. Why do we quote everything in terms of, of you know, currencies in particular? Say I'm uh, standing on, a, on, a, on, a, on the top of a hill, and I'm looking at a bird, and this bird I'm going to call the emergent bird, and it's sort, of, uh, it's sort of bouncing up and down a bit. It's volatile. And I can say from that that um, there's uh, some, some volatility due to one of, you know, a couple of things. One, uh, this bird is a pretty poor pilot, and secondly, there's some external shocks going on. There's a bit of volatility in the environment. And then I notice there are a lot of these emergents, there are, you know, about 70 of them, and they all seem to be going up and down together at the same rate. And I think, thank goodness I'm standing on dry land, because that looks really, really risky. Until I suddenly realise that I'm not standing on a hill, I'm standing on the deck of a ship, and it's me that's moving. Have emerging market currencies come off in the last year? Or has the dollar just got itself into an into unsustainable uh, 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 bubble? What are the two major problems of the world economy right now, structurally? As a macroeconomist, I have to say there are two problems. One, uh, which we probably haven't got time to go into, is uh, imbalances in the international monetary system. The international monetary system is the least reformed uh, in terms of the financial architecture, the reform going on at the moment. It's probably the least talked about, and it's probably the most important in terms of crisis prevention. We have massive imbalances which are akin to the imbalances that Eichen Green and, and Cooper and others have written about building up in the 60s, which led to the so-called Nixon shock in 1971, where the liabilities of the US were beyond uh, the gold backing uh, the dollar at the time, and the, uh, uh, the creditor nations of the time, today they're emerging markets, then they were European central banks, uh, basically pulled the plug on the dollar, and the dollar went down from $35 an ounce to actually reached in 1974, briefly, about $194 an ounce. Massive devaluation. Other currencies fell apart as well, so we haven't noticed that so much. Debt get ero get de the debt got eroded. But that was a major crisis of the global economy, and it led to a decade of inflation. We are, uh, similarly, in a world where, since the Asian crisis, we've had a huge uh, movement of savings from emerging markets, largely Asia and the oil producers, uh, funding, basically, pushing down the U.S. yield curve. And that, together with some ideological problems, has created uh, the big financial bubble we saw in, in 08. 
The structural conditions behind that bubble haven't really changed very much. Uh, basically, you know, we still assume markets are, are distributed normally when they are not. Um, and we still have uh, uh, basically uh, uh, oligopolistic uh, banks. Um, and we still have basically um, uh, the, the, the leverage, which is the other second major macroeconomic problem in the world. So where we are is we've got this very um, uh, difficult problem that in order to really solve the problem of how do you get money going into African <laughs> African power, African infrastructure, you have to understand why it is, why this seemingly nonsensical reality exists, that you've got this enormous amount of liquidity in the developed world, and yet not enough going into emerging markets. It is, does not make sense. But it does not make sense because people are in this mindset of thinking that risk is something massively simple. A toddler, when they, up to a certain sort of age of, of, and, and you know, cognitive development, when they leave their bedroom you know, in the morning and shut the door, it, because they can't see their bed anymore, they don't believe it exists. We're a bit like that in finance theory. If we can't count it, it doesn't exist. We just ignore it. We can count the past volatility of asset prices. So we call it risk. But risk is a very, very complicated thing. Risk is not additive, it's not simple. For most investors, large permanent loss is much more important than a bit of volatility. Risk is different for different people because we have different liabilities. We have different information sets. We have different power uh, to change the reality. We have different ability to, 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 to act fast. We have, um, uh, therefore, very, very different risks. So you can't say something is or isn't risky. You certainly can't say, as we sort of naturally assume, that everything in the emerging markets is always riskier than everything in the developed world. There's a number of things. There was, uh, I've quoted it somewhere in my book, but Willem Buter said once of something very similar. He said, this is perfectly obvious to anybody who doesn't have a postgraduate degree in economics from an Anglo-Saxon university. <laughs> and a lot, of, a lot of finance theory is basically like that. <laughs> and it's, people use this stuff because, despite knowing that it's wrong, people come out of business schools, they go into, into the city or into Wall Street, and the first thing they realize is that everything they learned in business school is pretty irrelevant. And it doesn't work anyway. I remember something that really got my hackles up was when I was reading a CFA uh, um, uh, you know, book. And it said about the, the CAPM model, well, it doesn't really work in practice, but it's well grounded in theory. No! <laughs> It is not well grounded in theory. In 1977, Richard Roll clearly demonstrated that the Fisher-Black equation on which it is based is an entirely circular argument. It is entirely circular. The CAPM has no theoretical uh, weight to it at all. So we live in a world where you know, we, we have these sort of images of how things work, and it seems to go on. I think one of the most fascinating things about investing is how people have different worldviews. And it's when those worldviews change suddenly, then you get crisis. Why am I talking about all this? Well, first of all, what I'm saying is that we need to start thinking about investing in emerging markets in a very, very different way. We need to think about building a power station in Africa as something which can fundamentally reduce risk for an institutional investor of enormous size and sophistication uh, you know, from, from the United States or the UK. Because, you know, Keynes said uh, liquidity is a fetish. Let's think about that for a moment. Uh, we've already seen very clearly uh, after 08 how the so-called liquid markets, all the correlations go to one. Uh, everything apparently is, uh, there's no diversification at all. Well, of course, the only thing that was diverse, the only thing that continues, you know, without any real impact is the stuff that's not liquid where all the finance is already, you know, hardwired into it. If you're building a power station, if you're building infrastructure, you know, the thing's going to happen anyway. Um, you know, given the, 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 the huge bottlenecks, you know, who on earth is not... What politician is going to suddenly stop, uh, you know, a power project? You've, you think about that in terms of risk, in terms of the, the broader sense of risk, you know, large permanent loss. The biggest risks in the world are coming from big macroeconomic shocks. Then one can see that this is a way to reduce risk. So um, one of the reasons I've got back into asset management 
is because I find this an interesting challenge. <laughs> um, and I really do think that um, I would you know, like to play my part in really trying to get this message across. I believe we have, we have two things which they didn't have in the 1930s when we also faced this huge problem of, of, of lack of aggregate demand and, and, and depression risk. One, Keynes invented macroeconomics, so we've got no excuse for not understanding what the problem is. Okay? Secondly, we've got the emerging markets as a massive potential source of aggregate demand. We've had talks, and I don't think we're ambitious enough, by the way. We've had you know, discussions about 100 billion a year. It needs to be bigger. Bigger. It needs to be a trillion. You know, it needs to be that sort of size. You know, India, which is about the same population as Africa, slightly more, uh, they're talking about you know, five, five trillion you know, over their sort of five-year plan. But actually, you know, that's, sorry, a trillion over five years. But that, there should be five trillion. And you know, Brazil could do a trillion. Africa should certainly be thinking about uh, 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 a trillion over, say, three years. It's that sort of number. The biggest difference between uh, uh, you know, the emerging markets uh, and a developed country when you, when you first arrive is, the, is, is what you see. It's the, it's the built environment. It's so obvious. And the thing about infrastructure is that, from a macroeconomic point of view, it absorbs huge amounts of capital, and it does, at the same time, increase productivity, because it's the bottleneck, it's the constraint. And we have this, uh, therefore, in not, unlike, say, you know, you know, creating inflationary bubbles, which has happened in the past, because the investment hasn't gone the right place. So uh, my, my sort of appeal, really, is not just an educational one, it's also to regulators. It's also, you know, it's not my idea, but I think it's a very good idea, and it's never going to happen, by the way. <laughs> but as a thought experiment, wouldn't it be wonderful when we get the next round of quantitative easing from the United States, that they actually do something about global aggregate demand by buying African infrastructure bonds? That would make a lot of sense. That would make an enormous amount of sense. So what you've got at the moment is all this liquidity, not knowing where to go. You've got people with core periphery disease in the West who don't understand what's going on. And the fact that you've got markets going all over the place, you've got, it, it, all that is evidence that they haven't got a clue what's happening. That's because they've never thought about the macroeconomics at all. Asset allocation has no space for macroeconomics, just as it's got no space for history or politics or anthropology. But in particular, macroeconomics really matters now. If you have structural change, that means that markets don't revert to the mean. So your entire method of, of mean reversion in terms of you know, rebalancing one's portfolio is the wrong thing to do. And so we have a very, very different world that we live in to the one that I think is, is largely driving this allocation process. And what we have is, is a, um, a, 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 a world in which we have a, a huge opportunity to invest uh, in, in infrastructure and in, and, and in emerging markets in general as a way to reduce risk, as a way to absorb huge liquidity, as a way to increase aggregate demand at a global scale and actually bring uh, the, 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 the now low growth sick economies in Europe and the United States up. And this is being ignored because we've got this ridiculous concept of risk. We've got this, uh, this mad idea that there's such a thing as a risk-free rate, which is an abuse of the English language. You know? And uh, we have this, these conceptions of, of how the world is and how the world... You know, we talk about risk-off and risk-on markets. We talk about all these things. We should be thinking about... Um, yes, we talked a lot about you know, development of projects. I'm very interested in the idea, as I think we've seen today, that yes, there is this bottleneck uh, of... of you know, a lack of bankable projects. And the way, of course, to get around that is to have, you know, the development phase uh, uh, incorporated into a private equity product, which is something I'm looking at. But the, 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 the bigger challenge, as well as the getting the modalities right, and I'm very pro-infrastructure bonds, I'm very pro-government uh, 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 leading the way and then stepping back. And I'm very interested in Really, really trying to get the asset allocation. If we can start with the asset allocation, everything else follows. I think it's very interesting. If you talk to investors, institutional investors, about infrastructure, first of all, it does mean two things. It does mean the equity, the debt, or the, the private equity, should we say, the, the, the sort of high returns one gets from building something, and then the, the, uh, uh, the yield, the debt, 
uh, after financial, after not just financial close, but after you've got revenue stream, and that is something which is seen as a, as a sort of proxy for government bonds, and much, much lower. And one can refinance, so that you, you have that. And that sort of financing started in Australia. Uh, it's been more common in the United States. It's sort of starting a bit in, in Europe. But it's not, it's not um, well known. Asset allocation is not a science. It's a, it's a series of fads. So the more you push something, you know, it does actually make a difference. And um, I just want to uh, uh, just finish off because I've run out of time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my definition of emerging markets is this. All countries are risky. The emerging markets are the ones where we perceive that risk. These are the markets where the risk is priced in. That's the definition of it. It's, that's it. It's, it's, it's all about prejudice. And what we have to understand is that, you know, there is no such uh, uh, thing as a, as, a, as, a, as a massive increase in risk just because you're in emerging markets. You know, we have a, um, after badgering one of the head of the international rating agencies for about 10 years, I finally got them to, uh, in private at least, uh, uh, admit to me that, yes, of course, core countries are rated several notches higher because they're a, they are core. And that's actually no great secret, because there's academic research uh, uh, about this exact thing, using dummy variables, that if you're a sub-Saharan African country, you're at least three or four notches uh, uh, lower, uh, graded lower, than uh, if you had exactly the same macro data, but you were in Western Europe. So that's prejudice. That's what emerging markets is. And just a final call, if and when we do have, you know, or as we do, sorry, as we have the, the huge pool, growing pool, we've heard about the 350 billion in Africa, across emerging markets, it's more like $4 trillion of domestic pension fund money, emerging markets, investing domestically, and then starting to invest abroad. The one thing they should not do is use Western rating agencies for their sovereign ratings. Because they, we know, have we heard about, do you remember about subprime rating agencies? Remember all that? Well, and they, who pays them? You know, we've got to work out, you know, actually uh, what sovereign risk is for ourselves. And actually, again, we come back to China because Dagong Rating Agency exists and it's probably a much better uh, uh, measure of sovereign risk in emerging markets than, than the major rating agencies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Jerome. That was uh, brilliant and provocative and it just reminds me of a... Of a uh, a line in the film, The Big Short, that's just come out, where they're talking about subprime, and one guy defines subprime, those subprime pro uh, products as cat shit wrapped in dog shit. Um, so that's, that, that's not an attempt to put you off your lunch, which is our, which is, which is our next event. Um, I would just like to ask Jerome very quickly, are you putting your money into African infrastructure? Uh, yes. There we are. I've been at the FT African Infrastructure Conference today in London, and uh, we've had an interesting set of conversations. I've been discussing my book, uh, which basically is a critique of finance theory, and how that has impacted institutional investors and their perception of risk, their perception of emerging markets, what I call core periphery disease, and how this has actually led to pretty uh, perfunctory, very small allocations to emerging markets, and within that, very small allocations to infrastructure in emerging markets. And that, that's just not good enough. So we have had lots of discussions about how to, if you like, get rid of those bottlenecks, how we can you know, change uh, the institutional framework such that we can get uh, the resources needed from you know, this huge pool of liquidity in the West to where it's really going to be productively employed in the emerging markets, specifically in Africa today. And this is actually an enormously important you know, issue for the global economy. You know, we have two things. Uh, that they didn't have in the 1930s. A, Keynes invented macroeconomics, so we've got no excuse for not understanding that, and B, we've got the emerging markets as a potentially huge source of global aggregate demand. And if we can channel several trillion dollars into emerging markets infrastructure, we can actually uh, increase productivity and growth without creating inflationary bottlenecks. And that's exactly uh, the focus uh, that we should be having uh, amongst central banks in the West. You know, we should be looking at this as a major global issue, not just as a small you know, uh, regional issue for Africa.